Um, 20 years. This is our 20th year, so it's been a lot of them. <laughs> Four a year, 20, that's 80 orientations. That's, uh, that's a lot of orientations. <laughs> but no, it seems like just yesterday that I started the school. I was uh, about 22 when I started it, and um, it was in downtown San Diego for eight years. And I was just, uh, my father's an illustrator, went to Art Center in Pratt in New York in the 60s. He's an awesome painter, um, great influence on me. And then I um, went to a school in LA called the California Art Institute, uh, not Cal Arts. Everyone always thinks Cal Arts. It was actually a small school about this size, run by a gentleman, Fred Fixler, who was a uh, um, Riley student, Frank Riley, in uh, New York at the Art Students League. And uh, he came out to California uh, probably when he was, I don't know if he was in his 50s, 60s, because when I met him, he was probably 70. And he um, did a lot of movie work. And he worked mostly exclusively in gouache, but he was a great, incredible draftsman. I mean, unbelievable, unbelievable, one of the best I've seen. And he started a small school, and I attended that school when I was 18. Uh, coming in, and it was an amazing experience because uh, my dad really didn't want me going to Art Center. Um, he thought that its heyday had come and gone and that it was way too expensive for what it was now. And I, I agree with him. Um, uh, you know, that schools have their they ebb and flow and they have their peaks and like the Art Students League was a phenomenal school in the 40s, but it's not so much anymore. It's lost, you know, a lot of them lose their way or whoever designed them, designed the program, passes away. It goes to understudies and then gets fragmented and any number of things can happen. So we've been um, kind of all the teachers that came out of uh, or here came out of our program. And that's kind of how I always groom my own teachers. So I didn't normally hire teachers from outside of our school because I wanted the continuity to be ridiculously high. And I don't want to confuse newer students or any of the students. So that was my philosophy. But the problem with that philosophy is that you have to train each student uh, or each teacher would be like, like, I think Eric was a student for about four years, five years. Most of them are four or five years in. Then they used to co-teach with me for another two years. And so you're about seven or eight years in before you even become a teacher. And it's hard to keep someone in a school for eight years. I mean, it's just not that easy to do. Um, but I think the misconception now a lot of people have is that art training is a four-year type endeavor. It's, it's not something that could be done that quickly, and it needs to be done repetitively. And that's one of the main differences between an atelier that you'll find and maybe, say, more a, um, a larger institution of learning in art, like Art Center or RISD or any of those, um, San Francisco Academy, is that the structure of the school is such that you have to, you can't repeat things because you never graduate. And that's unfortunate because you need to repeat those things like a, a head drawing class might need to be taken 10 times. Same structure, same teacher. It's just not that it's intellectually that hard. It's just a very subtle language, and the language has to be understood on an intuitive level, and that happens through correct repetition. And if you do incorrect repetition, then you build really bad habits, and those habits have to be removed by someone incredibly educated with a great eye, which are hard to find. So that's kind of the conundrum a lot of people get into, is that an eye is not put in place by itself. It has to be put in place by another eye that's well-educated. And the key to training is finding the eyes that you can hang out with long enough to get your eyes at a similar level. And that means the person has to have a vested interest in getting you as good or better than themselves. They have to watch over you. You have to try. They have to fix. You have to try. They have to fix. They have to demonstrate for you. Then they have to fix more. And it's just a constant back and forth like that until your eye gets honed like a, mus like a musician. You know, It's like uh, honing your ear or um, a musical sense for instruments or whatever. So repetition is key. And so don't feel like a lot of the classes say head drawing fundamentals. You might only take that once. But head drawing, you may take 10 times. The fundamentals classes are not more basic. They're more structured, more handouts, more learning the language, like the abstraction, for example. We use a system called the abstraction. And it's a rhythmical grid system based on bone protrusions and muscle rhythms. And so you know, it, it's these rhythms that connect from side to side all over your body. The, the, the muscles work in unison, and they work also interact in almost an orchestration that's really complex. And so the muscles are intertwining and overlapping, and those are called muscle insertions or intersections where you really want to be careful when you hit those insertions. If you cut through them, the body will become transparent. I mean, you just cut through a point where it should have stopped. So you have to be incredibly astute with your anatomy. And that's one area that I think a lot of people fall short on because it is a hard area of study and can be misconstrued as a boring area of study if you're taught it incorrectly or if you just don't have an interest in it. So if you don't have an interest in it, I don't have a lot of easy things to say other than you need to get one, <laughs> you know, an interest in it. Because um, you can't navigate form. The old saying is it's hard to indicate what you don't know. And I would say it's almost impossible to indicate what you don't know. So if you're going into 
say, do a more brushy brush uh, paint style, say like uh, Fetchin or maybe Schmidt or some of these other painters that I admire so much, um, Soroya, you're looking at wet into wet painting with and against the form quickly and efficiently, and you can't model form if you don't understand form. So you don't know whether to go brush stroke here or go down this way and up this way to leave the highlight, or do you want to go around the orbicularis or do you want to run around the laugh line? If you don't understand where these, this interaction, this orchestration is occurring, then there's no way you're going to stop your brush strokes properly. And so your paintings are going to be like kind of not good loose. You know, there's good loose and there's not so good loose. And the greatest loose painters were maestro, just technicians of, um, of procedure, layering procedure, and understood a great level. I would say it's even harder to paint that way than it is to paint hyper tight. Hyper tight takes a lot of patience, a lot of time, but you don't have as much editing and opinion about what you are manipulating. Your calligraphy, idealization of form, which we call it. These are concepts that go past just academics and into more intuition and understanding of feeling your way through a painting rather than thinking your way through a painting. And a lot of people don't really understand that concept because it's very seldom even a, talked about in any books I've seen or even most people just, they don't go into that realm of what really makes you tick as a painter. And for me, I don't have a visual memory that's uh, photographic, so I rely heavily on my feeling about when I'm looking at my drawing and I'm navigating that drawing that was a, like a two and a half hour drawing from life class. Um, I'll just remind me, when I'm looking at my own drawing, I'll remember other drawings I've seen and the emotions that it evoked when I saw them. And if my drawing's evoking the same emotions, then I know I'm going in the right direction. So, because I don't have a razor sharp, like I can't close my eyes and just see razor, you know, just clearly. Um, it's more hazy, if at best. So for me, I'm not really quite sure how that system works where you're able to pull deep information that's been committed to memory, mostly academic, to the surface and then manipulate it, idealize it, and make it look better than what you're seeing. So the key for me is part of what you see, part of what you know, and part of what you wish you saw. And that makes great paintings. I mean, the best paintings. They're not copies. They're interpretations based on very soulful interpretations. So a lot of times um, what you're trying to instill in people at, at this atelier is their eye first and foremost, not how you guys are going to paint. I'm not that concerned with ultimately the style of painting that you adopt because they're all good. I mean, there's good tight styles, there's good loose styles, there's good colorful styles, there's good monochrome styles. It's more about um, learning to see and articulate the language of seeing through edges, value, shape, and calligraphy. Um, so we have edges, we have values. Those two are going to be fairly non-compromising. They're not going to want to bend much. Um, you can bend them a little bit, you can manipulate them a little bit. Then you have color, which is actually the most lenient of all the sciences, but the most abused. Because people aren't good enough at their edges and values so they try to overcompensate with color, say bright color, but no color will, um, will, will, will kind of shore up bad edges and bad value and bad shape. There, it doesn't matter what you put down. It wouldn't. It would only accentuate your problems and make them look worse. It's like when people go full value and put black in, uh, if they do it too prematurely at the wrong time in a drawing, if the drawing doesn't have the scaffolding to support it, it's simply going to fall apart. It's going to magnify your problems or it'll magnify the good things that you do. So it'll do either or. So you want to work your way up to your full values. You want to learn to manipulate your edges. And values and edges, you can get a beautiful drawing with just edges. And value is not absolutely necessary to get a beautiful drawing. You'll see like in Vanderpool's book, some drawings that are so light you can barely even see them. And you look at, oh, that's a beautiful drawing. You know, there's no full value range in that. Just beautiful edge work. So edges are absolutely pivotal to getting a 3D effect on a flat surface, right? Values are the ones that give it that extra punch to really give it you know, that oomph like that, where it goes full value. But that could have been a beautiful drawing. That was a nice drawing in various stages of the completion. And that's how you should think of your drawing. The laying should look good. The first level of mapping should look good. The rhythmical grid you put down should look good. The, you know, every stage should look nice until you finish. And if you, if a stage isn't looking nice, then you have to go back and either we come in and assist you and fix it. And what we'll do, say you were working on that drawing and it was on the pad here and there were some issues with it. We would, you would go put a piece of tracing paper over the top of it, 18 by 24 tracing paper, and one of the instructors would come by and do what's called a layover tracing for you, correcting your drawing, talking to you about theory, okay, here's the abstraction lines you're missing, here's some things you should be thinking about, da da da, we could be talking about any number of things depending on the level you're at. That one-on-one -on -one time with you in the class will be very specifically tailored to your needs. Otherwise, like when we demonstrate, because we'll demonstrate every class for you, and that will be like a 25-minute demo. The goal of that is simply to inspire you, show you the procedure kind of in a fast forward kind of motion, and then ultimately you guys will try to mimic that. 
And then as you get in trouble, we'll do tracings for you. And so you may be in, in those tracings, you can take home, you can use them for the rest of the class by lifting it, looking at our lines, put it down, say, okay, the shoulder has to come down here, put it down there. And you just kind of use a little cheat sheet. But you also, it, it keeps you from being intimidated to work on the drawing after we've worked on it. Because sometimes if we do something really nice, like I don't want to touch it, you know, I don't want to touch that head. It's, you know, that's not you know, really what we're after. So what we'd want you to do is be able to go on there and feel confident and comfortable fixing it. And you can use that layover. You can also take the layover home and study from it. Tape it on a piece of paper, put it up in front of you, sit down with a blank piece of paper and mimic the calligraphy. Because if you can get, you know, when we look at the calligraphy of any of these drawings, and I'll pull it down in a second, I just grabbed a handful of my drawings. And over the years, I'll, like at the end of a term, I'll rip out my best head drawings, best figure drawings, best quick sketches, clip them on a piece of board, semester number 82, I don't know, 100, whatever I'm on, um, and I'll slip it in with my stack. And my stack now is about this high of all the ones that I've kept. And that's just drawings I've kept. I threw out three times that. You know, and those are hour effort, two hour efforts, three hour efforts. I mean, these are not like fast, just, you know, like sketches. So you're looking at, I don't know, tens of thousands of hours of drawing. Um, and I will continue to do that my whole life. I will never stop training like that. Um, you kind of have to liken it to someone like Tiger, well, I always say Tiger Woods, but you know, he's kind of out of his form now. But, but when he was in form, I mean, and it just goes to show you, I mean, you can't really stop your training or, or it's a cerebral thing and art is very cerebral. So a lot of people can get derailed just from getting inside their head too much and kind of head tripping, you know, we kind of call it, where you just kind of, you're wrapped up too much in the head, your head and it, it just kind of derails you a little bit. What you want a good system of training to look like is here's where you want to be and here's where you are and you just want to look like a good stock. You want to kind of go up and then you want to flat line, then you go down a little bit, but then you go up even higher and then you'll be, and a lot of times those flat line, what we call plateauing, is where you've saturated yourself with so much knowledge that you're just overwhelmed. And the mind has to kind of get used, it has to kind of sift down and take its proper place. And so you're going to be overusing the information, underusing it, you're going to be trying to use it. You know, you're just not going to find that equilibrium yet. And the eye and the hand are going to be competing with each other constantly and not in a friendly manner. Okay, the eye's going to see one thing, the hand's going to want to do another thing. Because the hand dexterity may not be good enough to match the intellectual prowess or understanding of the concepts. Which you may have a great understanding, you might say, you know, I really grasp this. And that's for if, if you're really intellectual, you'll be very frustrated by that because you'll look at us do a demo and it looks so easy and we distill it down very simply. You go to do it and you're all thumbs. You know, you're all, you just, your hand won't deliver the goods. And that's not something that's, everybody goes through that. That's a natural progression and it's, it's uh, a, uh, don't let that trip you out too much. That's mostly just dexterity hasn't come up yet. And most things in our lives do not demand a great amount of dexterity. I mean, using an iPhone, I mean, talking on the phone, using, I mean, that stuff's not going to be the dexterity of a surgeon. And you have to have a surgeon's hand. I mean, a hand that is incredibly tactile sensitive with a tool, not only pressure sensitivity, but also can push and pull, because with a brush, you're going to be pushing and pulling and the brush is going to expand and contract and it's going to be about that long and it's going to be at an arm's distance from the canvas. So you're using all points, you know, your shoulder, your elbow and your wrist and you're painting more like we draw. So when we sharpen our pencils in this most interesting manner, like that, right? The reason is, is because we can calligraphically manipulate it like a brush, as close as we can get with a pencil. If we're drawing like this, which 90% of people do, is they draw like they write, you're stuck with scratchy line that's interpreting clean form. And when you look at anyone here, you don't see any cross-hatching on anybody. You see edges and values and shape and color and clean, clean shape. Um, so drawing and cross-hatching is an interpretation of reality, which is beautiful, but not a good way to train your eye to be a painter. So you'll see a lot of inkers like Bernie Wrightson or people that I have the utmost respect for, but they're not great painters. Uh, you know, I mean, they, 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 the, the, the jump from hardcore linear to painting does not always happen. I mean, you see someone like Frazetta who is an incredible inker and an incredible painter and could go between those two languages very efficiently. So when you think of these as languages, okay, so charcoal is a language and gouache is a language and oil is a language and watercolor is a language and pastel is a language, very similar to verbal languages. And they all have little accents and little eccentricities and idiosyncrasies that you have to master. And in the process of mastering those, you want to become fluent in them. And you only become fluent at anything through ridiculous amounts of repetition that's correct. Right? So when we start thinking about having to balance these different languages, it's pretty overwhelming. And if people would give it more respect like that, I think they would have less expectations on themselves and be less hard on themselves. Because a lot of people come in thinking, hey, I should be good at this. I took head drawing. It's like, why? I mean, go play piano for 10 weeks and see what happens. I mean, you're not going to be playing anything great. You know, you're going to be, I mean, it's going to be kind of, it's just not going to happen. It's too complex of a language. 
So we can distill it down into hard, soft, thick, thin, light, dark, curved, straight, warm, cool. You know, like five concepts, six concepts. And everything could be distilled down and broken down into those concepts. But at the end of the day, you have to make thousands of decisions on a painting that all have to be in the proper context. And is it hard? Is it soft? Is it thick? Is it thin? Is it warm? Is it cool? Is it straight? Or is it curved? Now you've got a thousand of those decisions to make that all build off of each other. That becomes progressively more complex. So the actual concept, concept itself can be broken down very simply, very easy to understand. And then to do something like that becomes a lot more difficult because now you're compounding all those decisions. Simple decisions compounded, many of them will become complex. And so you always want to keep that in mind that although the language is not, the common denominator is great because a hard edge is a hard edge in pastel, in gouache, in oil, in any medium. It has to be, it's going to be hard. How do you get it with pastel? A little differently than you get it with oil, differently than you get it with gouache. But it's still, you've got to struggle for that hard edge. So once you understand how to interpret edges and how to notice edges and read edges and values, then you can cross-platform between new languages fairly quickly. So it's not quite as complex as Russian, Chinese, French, where you have different vocabulary, you have different uh, alphabet, you have different everything. So that, yeah, I, I try to say liken it to languages, but yeah, languages would be a little harder, right, because of that. But still, people don't give it the necessary respect and therefore get very frustrated and usually quit. Uh, or think that it's some God-given gift that you were born with and that you're just naturally talented. And, and I hate when people call me that because it distills down those 10,000 hours I told you about into I just happened to be good and never did anything for it. You know, it's like, no, I worked. Most of my life has been about designing uh, an articulate training program for myself that could get me from point A to point B a lot of times on my own. Um, I got some good schooling, but not as long as I'd like to. And the rest of it was just do it on your own. And it was really hard. Hard to study anatomy on your own without any instructors. And I didn't have a good anatomy instructor. I never, no one wanted to teach it. It was too hard to teach. It's hard to find someone articulated teaching it and inspired to teach it. And I'm very much that way. Eric's very much that way. Eric and I are probably the two most, I would say, um, excited about anatomy. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but there's a lot of like ben, um, Stan's coming up really strong at it. Ben's really good at it. Meadow's really good at it. Everybody here is good at it. But being good at something and teaching something are two different things. You have to have a passion for it, and then you have to be phenomenally intuitive and good at it, especially something like anatomy, because there's no way around it. You have to be able to articulate certain concepts, um, otherwise people lose interest. And I was not very good at articulating names for years. I thought, um, I mean, I could draw way b uh, before I could ever recite names. And so as a student, don't worry so much about the names. If you're going to teach it, at some point, yes, you will have to delve into the deep muscle names, insertions, origins, functions, all that. But We've got to kind of, we have so many areas of study. We have our portrait area, we have our figure area, we have our landscape, we have our still life, we have our narrative figurative stuff. We have all these different disciplines and each discipline has its own little list of things that need to be studied in it, you know? And each one of them are concurrently kind of working off of each other. So you want to set up an articulate study program for yourself, both at the school and outside the school. And part of that's going to be done by us assisting you, by advising you, once we get to know you a little bit better. We'll start saying, well, you know, based on what I saw this last term, I mean, I would, and you're probably going to know. You're going to say, yeah, I'm just rocky at head as can be. So I will take head again. Take head drawing, head 20-minute head lay-ins, head drawing, features and facial expressions, and then study it at home. And in three months, you'll be significantly better. Will you be masterful at it? No, of course not. There's no way. It wouldn't matter if Michelangelo was in here laying it down for you. It, it's still, the, the work has to be done. And there's a small book by George Leonard called Mastery. And it's just, um, he's an Aikido master. And he writes very poignantly about the different personality types and which ones are conducive to mastering and which ones never will master anything. Because it's definitely a personality type. And you have to learn what configuration you are. Because a lot of people love the thrill of the start. It's new, it's exciting, great. And then it gets kind of starts getting boring, monotonous, tiring. Stop, go to something else. Oh, it's great, it's fun, it's great. Stop, go somewhere else. And they never master anything. They just jump from activity. And those would be more dilettante-oriented people, right? They're gonna, they can't couldn't consider themselves a professional uh, path of course of action because you're never going to make it to professional that way. You can't just keep stopping everything all the time. So at some point, you have to get strong resolve, be very patient, persistent, and cultivate that through the process of training. And that's one of the byproducts of training that I did not anticipate getting was um, this idea that I was acquiring these life skills that were really cool, you know, incredibly helpful in other areas, just relationships, everything. So over 20 years of teaching now at um, 
you know, I was teaching for a while, eight to 10 classes a week, you know, for many years. And Eric was doing that for a while too. And Eric and I, and, and most of the teachers around here are going to be two to three to four classes a week, which is still a lot. Um, and you won't normally see people of our caliber, like myself or Eric or any of them, teaching on a regular week to week basis. I mean, it's almost non existent. You'll occasionally see guys doing four day workshops that are really good, like Nelson Shanks or something. But they're not going to be doing grind out, head drawing fundamental class 10 weeks, week in, week out, year in, year out. It, it doesn't happen very often. So, and that's the conundrum for you guys learning is that you want to find a group of committed teachers that are incredibly good for whatever reason and have made it part of their life to do that. Whether And it's nice because it's a very beneficial win-win. I benefit greatly from helping you guys. My skills get more intuitive. I just get incredibly, I just continually get more and more intuitive. But it's a huge amount of energy that I invest in, in, in the people that come through here. Um, and, I, and we take it really seriously. So, but I have a very talkative way of teaching. I talk constantly while I paint. I talk all, as much as I'm talking now while I'm painting, which is kind of an odd skill. It's kind of a right, left brain thing. And a lot of people don't do that that well because you, you have to do a copious amount of teaching and be intuitive to the level where you don't have to think about your painting at all or your drawing or whatever. And you can just simply talk about the concepts that are in your head while the painting's actually happening. It's weird. It's a weird, con it's very odd. But um, all, most of the people you see here are really good at it. Eric's unbelievably good at it. Uh, Meadow's awesome. All of them. Because they train the same way as I did. And, tra and I trained them the same way to teach the same way as we did, which, and which is the way I was taught, which was you needed to demo, you needed to talk, and you needed to do tracings, and you needed to inspire. So not only were you teaching, but you're entertaining on, on some level. Because a lot of this stuff is dry, and you've got to entertain people while they're doing it. Otherwise, they quit. Um, so there's all this kind of complexity that goes on. Now, we use smooth newsprint, and we use it for very specific reasons. We want to be able to handle our edges really nice, and rough newsprint's very hard to get that kind of um, uh, edge manipulation on. It just fights you the whole time. It's a beautiful paper, but not for what we do. So we carry it here, and you can pick some of it up. Kelly's going to be here helping. My wife's actually up, um, our, our goddaughter. She's having her uh, first day at, uh, you know, it's her brother's um, daughter, and uh, they're up at Disneyland. For, uh, it's her first Disneyland experience, so she's three. So she's up there, but she's usually here, and I wish she was here to, to, to introduce you to her. But she's very quiet, very mellow, behind the scenes, but does a huge amount to keep the school um, running and, and has over the last 20 years. It's been, it's been a lot of work, but a great, a great uh, uh, thing. I mean, we both enjoy it greatly. Um, so we've got the paper. We've got some of my drawings. We've got the pencils, and I'll sharpen one in a minute just to show you how that's done because it's, there's an art to it. Um, these are the workhorse pencils we use. They're the 1710 Conte pencils. We also use the Wolf Carbons, which are a hybrid. Are they call, they're called Wolf, Wolf's Carbon, but they're kind of like, um, you know, like a dra charcoal drafting pencil. But you need a 6B or a 4B in these guys. The Bs are way rock hard. Um, and then we have the Primos, which, and the old Ritmos, which they don't make anymore. But the Prim, well, they do, but they're no, not what they used to be. They changed the consistency, so I don't use them much, the new ones. And then the Primos, which are a really soft pencil. And so those are really the three that we use a lot because um, the pencil has to be able to be sharpened to a taper and not all pencils will do that. There's a lot of great pencils, but you, maybe you'll get one out of five that'll sharpen that way. And a lot of people say, well, do I have to sharpen it that way? And yes, you do. Um, <laughs> so there you go. Um, and a lot of people don't like it and they get, but you've got to embrace the idea that if you're having a hard time just sharpening the pencil and you have no patience for that, how are you going to do a drawing like that? Yeah. I mean, or a painting? It's just not going to happen because the mindset is not conducive. Um, there's no way that that could happen. So we need to align ourselves with the fact that everything's kind of like the full wax on, wax off, karate kid thing. Why are you getting me to do this? Oh my God, this pencil. But you're just learning, you're learning dexterity, patience, and just drawing and painting just from sharpening your pencil at the trash can. I mean, you're already building a sense of dexterity that's going to help you. And so I'm really a big fan of that. Up here, I have my, my a pad that I just chucked a bunch of drawings in. This is, I've got pads all over the place. Um, this one's got some um, different drawings I'll just quickly go through. And then the wall is drawings people accomplished here at the school uh, that are fantastic efforts, so we'll put them up uh, for inspiration for you guys. And you can take photos of those things uh, as well. And so um, this one here uh, was, again, a two and a half hour drawing. I think on Friday night I come in occasionally, and it's an open workshop. It's the only open workshop we have during the, the week. So I um, will come in and just draw to get practice, just like, just like going to the gym. Um, and we don't instruct on the Friday night. We just, it's just a drawing time. So it's, f it's free for the full-time students, and it's cheap for people that want to just come in and draw. It's like 
you know, 20 bucks or something. So it's a good model, uh, good, good models with um, good lighting, good environment, and just real, real mellow. So all these are about two and a half hour efforts. That one I never finished, but it's kind of got a nice lay-in where you can kind of see the mapping and the linear lay-in down here, and then you can see what I'm heading towards. So the whole drawing looked like this prior to this all being laid in. And so what you do is you work from the head to the neck to the shoulders to the crotch to the ground. And you, each time you go through that pass back up to the top, you layer a layer of information on. So the first one is linear. You're just trying to get the, the, the person that, you know, on the page properly. And then, so we want to look at the top of the head, the bottom of the foot, look for the big graphic shape. Obviously, the pose is going from left to right. So you don't want to put the figure over here because you're going to crop off his arm. So you want to push him as far to the left as you can. You want to utilize the whole page if possible. And it's simple composition, but still composition nonetheless. Then you get it laid in with line, right? It is a tonal method. It looks like it's tonal, right? But we have to go through line to get to where the tone's supposed to go. And we call that mapping. We also call that the lay-in. So this is, your lay this is what the lay-in looks like right here. Once that's looking good, then you inject a middle value range, right? We got our values up there, zero being black, 10 being white. We want to be about number five, because that way we can still fix mistakes if we're, and we're going to have them. That's the thing you got to remember drawing. You don't just lay off things and it looks good. Everything skews, the head gets dropped, now that has to move, this has to move, that has to move. You're always moving information. And so you have to be willing to do that. And you can only do that if you're light. If you go black, it's not coming out of the paper. And there's no fixing that. So you've got to stay really light-handed, really relaxed. So these are all, again, just, you know, just little sketches. And some are more calligraphic than others, right? Some are more um, clean than others. Some have different, you know, so I change styles up a little bit. I play around with styles. But they all look very 3D. They all look very articulate. They have a good sense of design. They have a good sense of calligraphy. Um, they're, you know, they're, they're, they've got, they're good drawings. And those drawing, all drawings that are good contain those attributes. Um, otherwise, you get off into left field, and all of a sudden, you have to start calling it something else, like abstract expressionism, whatever you want to call it. But it's no longer accurate, right? It's just, you, you can say whatever you want, but it's just not accurate. So if you want to play by the rules, and you want to be a representational artist of a high level, then you're going to be working within a tiny range of what we would call creative expression. Little bit of color feel, little bit of compositional choices, subject matter, those are going to be things that you can put your fingerprint identity on. But as far as edges, values, and shapes, they're not really up for a debate. They are what they are, and if you mess them up, they're wrong. And there's not much you can say after that. So um, this was a master study, Russian master study. Um, I'm actually working on, we're working on an online version of the school right now, which will be, a, hopefully, I'll launch in about a year, and we'll get everybody involved at that point. Um, this was a study I did. Uh, I, d I did this demo from straight to finish uh, for that. Um, it was probably a two-and-a-half-hour demo or two-hour demo, and I went straight through on it. So, um, but that's going to be a neat thing coming down the road, which is um, could also complement people that are studying here uh, for their homework. They could go home and do the online. It'll be very reasonable. They can actually train. It'll set it out a very specific training regimen for you. And then the class is obviously the best place to really get honed uh, in person. This is a little figure invention. So I'm always making up figures. I always just sit and doodle figures out of my head. And again, it helps you to reaffirm whether or not your anatomy is actually truly fully realized. You can't make up that if you don't know what that stuff is, right? That's really advanced. I mean, that's really advanced. So doing these kind of figure inventions, there's very few people that even do them that well. Comic guys, uh, visual development artists that work in the movie industry, the comic industry, the um, gaming industry, they have to do that kind of stuff. The creatures don't exist. The, um, the, the, the figures need to be designed. And someone's got to make them up. So... You know, for those of you who are in, these are quick sketches, right? And they're very articulate little guys. And we use a system of the abstraction, and this is where the best place to memorize the abstraction is in actual quick sketches. Those are probably four minutes or five minutes, actually. Um, but they're very, you can tell what every pose is doing. Some are better than others. Some are more articulate than others. But when I first started quick sketch, it was one of the first methods in this technique that made me want to learn this system because it was amazing to watch people do two-minute drawings that looked like a full finish. I couldn't believe it. I was like, how do you do that? I mean, and part of it was they knew so much and their hand dexterity was so good. When you watch someone like Eric or myself do quick sketch, it's a very slow process. It's not that fast at all. It's not like we're, you know, panicking. We're just making really good decisions. Head, neck, shoulders. And I stop and I look. So I scan, identify, predict, decide, execute. Scan the model, identify what I want to do. So you scan, identify, you predict what's going to happen, or identify, predict, and then you decide, and then you execute. But you don't do that all at once. A lot of people are like, 
they're drawing, their hands moving. What are you, what's going on? I mean, stop, think about what you're doing and put it down clean, articulate. Because 52, my teacher used to call it chicken scratching. We scratch around looking for the right line and you end up with 62 lines that have to be removed. And, and it's like a chicken scratching around looking for food. I mean, it just, it's, not an, it's not efficient at all. And everybody does it. Um, but we'll try to break you that or, or at least encourage you to try to learn our, uh, this articulate method of navigating such complicated form. Think of it like a GPS system for drawing. But it has to be committed to memory, it has to be practiced, and the lines are meant to be bent around the body types of the people. So if it's a lean, muscular female, it's going to have different, um, the abstraction lines are going to bend around that type. If it's a more Rubenesque model, they're going to bend around that type. If it's a heroic male type, so on and so forth. So, but you can see that these are maps. I don't have time to fill in my shadow. I have no time for that. I only have, I barely have enough time to get an articulate figure down that's mapped well. So this is just shorthand mapping that tells any, anybody that understood this language could sit down with any of these pages and fill it in and make them look totally 3D with very little effort because all the mapping has been done and that's where all the thought process occurs. That's the hard part. Filling it in and taking it to a finish like some of these other ones, that's easy. I mean, that's a lot easier. That's where your brain's gonna be taxed your decision making is going to be taxed and you're going to have to be very um, uh, present. Uh, that word presence is really important. Um, a lot of people draw and daydream and think about, you know, whatever they're going to do after class or what happened on the way to class or something that's going on in their life. And they're not really fully engaged in the process of solving a creative problem. So being engaged, being present, these are concepts that we'll talk about. They're also linked more spiritual type practices and things of that sort. So meditation, yoga, um, things of that sort can really help to tai chi. All these things can help to accentuate your ability to handle long periods of concentration uh, for long periods of intense concentration at a high level, right? And some people do that better than others. Some people have OCD, some people are this, some people are that, some people are whatever. Um, so everyone's working with different gifts, different skills. Um, some people are gonna have to work really hard to, um, that was Elaine for that one before, that was just some little head studies. Um, not much in this. I didn't, I have just, like I said, I just grabbed a few that I thought would be inspirational I could show you. Um, so that's what my normal, a normal pad will look something like that. It'll have head drawings in it, it'll have quick sketches in it, it'll have figure drawings in it, it'll have abstract pages in it, it'll have figure invention in it. And this is just like my, my um, where I go to memorize information. It's cheap, it's efficient, paper's cheap, pencil's cheap. I can memorize the nose planes and the information and then translate it to oil, which is incredibly expensive. So why do I want to learn that in oil? It'd take me 10 times as long and be more expensive and more frustrating and more, all kinds of things. So drawing is a link to painting, especially in this manner, and it's the cheapest way to get good at painting. So when people jump from this drawing method and they get really proficient over to painting, their first paintings are incredibly advanced. I mean, amazing. Um, and so I'll go, we'll, you know, we'll go over that at a later date, but I could talk for hours about this kind of stuff. But most of it is, um, again, um, it's about inspiration, it's about articulation, it's about becoming verbally or visually articulate with your, um, what it is you want to say. At which time you can then start, and you probably don't even have to start doing this, it'll just find you. Your natural abilities, your natural gifts will start to come out, but they'll come out on a solid foundation, and as a result, you'll, you'll have potential to maybe make a living at it. And if you're looking at making a living at it, then it's all about fast, good, fast, and good is what they want. And, um, and, and they're willing to pay a lot of money for that. But um, some people are too slow to work in a lot of the, um, like in visual development, which is what I used to work in. And I did, a, I did a, you know, movie poster comps. I did storyboarding. I did um, uh, book covers. I had a book cover rep in New York. I did uh, theme park concepting visual development. I did video game concepting visual development. I did heavy metal covers. I worked for Wildstorm. I worked for DC. I worked for Marvel. I worked for all these different, you know, DreamWorks. Um, Got offered a job in visual development with them, but did not take it ultimately. But um, I, I have a huge background in, in illustration and appreciation for the demands of illustration, which are fast demands and highly professional. Fine art's a little more heidi flighty, touchy feely. Paint when you want to, put a painting out, whatever, sell it whenever. Da 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 da. -da. It's a little bit more. I don't know. A lot of people in the best fine artists are ex-illustrators that became fine artists that have an incredible discipline through the years that they did illustration. They know how to meet a deadline. They know how to leverage themselves. They know how to stay up all night and work with, and still be good. And they have this tenacious ability to do that. And then when they go to fine art, they're able to direct their energies a lot more intelligently. Whereas in a lot of people that don't have that struggle greatly with hitting deadlines and, and, and getting their work out there and building a name and all that kind of good stuff. So um, I, I would recommend, I mean, illustration nowadays, a lot of people say, isn't it dead? I mean, no. 
No, Eric does great with illustration. Lucas does great with illustration. You just got to be really good. That's the thing is people always complain when they, like, like especially I always hear this in self-publishing. Self-publishing is hard. And you look at what they're trying to publish and you go, that's going to be really hard because that's terrible. It's bad quality. It's bad content. It's badly executed. Yeah, you're, gonna, you're not going to be able to sell that well. You go to someone like Dinotopia, you get James Gurney, and he comes out with a nice concept, does it, makes a million dollars. He's great. I mean, it's a great product. And, he, and it's, he self-published it, and he did great because it was great. So, I mean, it's not rocket science. You've got to have something substantial to put out there, and you'll do fine. If you don't, you'll blame it on the starving artist thing, and, oh, yeah, everybody starves as an artist. And it's, yeah, if you're bad, you will starve. I guarantee it. Um, if you're good, you have a great shot of making a great living. Uh, because everything that you drive, everything you wear, everything you watch, all the movies, all the video games your kids play, everything that's entertainment driven is designed by some artist somewhere. Somebody's got to sketch it out. I don't care whether it's on digital or whether it's traditional, but at some point, someone's got to sit and design that stuff that you enjoy. And all the world is, is driven by that. Because otherwise, laboring humanity would perish, right? What do we do? Just a bunch of people working for nothing? I mean, no. They work to entertain, to enjoy themselves, and the artists will provide the entertainment. And enjoyment. So how could you not make a good living at that? But you got to be good, right? You got to be really, you got to be able to come to a client. Here's what I can offer you. I, you. I can make you a lot of money. So DreamWorks will say, okay, I will pay you $250,000 a year so I can make $250 million a year, right? That's a good payoff. So they'll say, yeah, it's nothing to hire this really great skilled guy that can grind out these animation films for us, right? Thousands of people, hundreds of people, right, working on these things. And we're going to pay them really well. And at the end of the day, we're going to make billions of dollars off of it. And, but unless you can provide them a service that's going to make them a lot of money, why would they hire you? Right? So you've got to come to the table with skills that are very desirable. Not skills that a million other people can do, but skills that 50 other people on the planet can do. Then you're incredibly desirable and incredibly valuable to lots of companies, lots of people. And you can then leverage. You can dictate. You can negotiate. You can get paid more. And you can have fun doing it. So that's, that's what I was always after. And I always put my eggs in, don't just be different, just be good. Good's different enough nowadays, right? I mean, it's just phenomenally good is you stand out like a sore thumb. You know? And those people are always, always in, in, in demand. So once you can get those skills, then it's just a matter of where do you want to plug yourself. And yeah, it takes time to build um, relationships. And then you've got to work on your people skills so that you don't mess that up, right? But, People are not, not trying to hire you and make money off of you. They, they want to do that. They want to give you work. But they need you to be really good for them to want to do that. So it's very common sense driven. So people say, do you teach, um, do you teach a business? I just taught it right there. Be good. Be good, no problems. Not so good, doesn't matter what I'm teaching you about business. It's not going to make any difference. Because you can't. You got the cart so far in front of the horse, what are you going to do? You know. So, um, so I don't worry too much about the business. I just worry about getting you guys good. Once that happens, whatever you want to do, the sky's the limit. I mean, you can just start to build. And as you go, you're going to change your opinions. You might come in wanting to be an animator and ultimately end up falling in love with painting and be, want to be a fine art painter. doesn't mean you won't do a stint of freelance illustration to subsidize your long-term goal of wanting to be a fine art painter because that's a little bit longer incubation, usually. Um, certain job requirements are going to, someone here could be here two years and be able to go work in a certain career. Other people are going to be on the 10, 15, 20 year. You know, I want to paint what I want to paint, live where I want to live, and make a lot of money. Well, it's going to take you about 20 years. Okay, I mean, you know, then that's the fast track, you know, but I mean, that's, that's like the Rolls Royce. I mean, who wouldn't want to do that? You know, I mean, who would not want to do that in their right mind? So, um, you know, you're going to have a lot of people going for that brass ring. You're going to have a lot of people that won't have the tenacity or the wherewithal to follow through on it. And um, we'll have to go off and do other things, and that's fine too. Just shoot for the bar so high that when you come down, you can take a job that's still really entertaining, make a lot of money and still have fun, and then still have that goal maybe of someday being a fine art painter or something. Um, but fine art, really, to most people, it's the mature years of your career that you'll do fine art. So it's your second or third career in art. It's not your first one, usually. Some people will go right into it. I went right into it, but I, I did illustration and fine art together and ran the school, all three of them, at full bore for like 10 years. So it was crazy. And I was 20 in my 20s, and I... I have a lot of energy, so I didn't, but it, at some point it did start to kind of, both, all of them were doing successful for a while, but at some point you can't keep that kind of drive going. You just have to pick your battles. So I started to kind of narrow down into fine art, and I've been plugging away at fine art, but the teaching's a passion of mine. It always has been. So um, I spent a lot of time still on teaching and trying to reach more people that way, and so I still love that. And because I, when I was um, 
in athletics, and I came from a heavy athletic background, that's what I wanted to do professionally, it was all, mostly for me, it was just, I loved to train. Training was everything to me. The race was okay, the training was fun. So that's kind of weird. I mean, not weird, but that's what makes really good people in stuff is that people that just fall in love with the fundamental repetition of daily grind training and actually enjoy it. Not like, oh, it's a burden to draw, to coming into life drawing class. I have never felt like coming into class and teaching head drawing was a burden. It's fun time for me. It's, it's pure pleasure when I come in. You know, yeah, you work with some difficult personalities, you got some problems, this and that. But um, overall, it's a very... It's kind of like if you were maybe a, a, a traditional actor, like a stage actor versus a movie actor with a blue screen behind you or with an actual crowd that interacts with your, your, your um, you know, when you're acting and, and you get that immediate response. That would be a lot funner for a true, uh, probably, thespian, right, than doing the movie stuff. They'd be like, oh, shit, it's boring, blue screen, I gotta pretend like, you know, some you know, T-Rex is chasing me or something, I don't know. Um, and then, you know, you get that live interaction. So teaching is kind of that live interaction. You get to come in, you get to work with people, you get to help them get better help them enrich their lives, and in turn it helps you enrich your life and you get better and faster, and it's a good win-win for everybody. And it's very few times that you can find a win-win where everybody seems to benefit from what you're doing. Usually, you know, it's not, it's not always that fair. So, um, pencils, I'll go over in a minute. Um, here's some books. The books I brought are the Loomis books. I just bought a smatter. I have thousands of books, and I invest lots of money in books and a lot of time in getting books that are out of print. Um, I cannot bring them all in, obviously. So I grabbed a few that are kind of the pick and shovel books that we use. The anatomy books, I brought Hogarth, I brought Bridgman, the condensed Bridgman books, which are here, which are in small form. These are, um, George Bridgman is a hard guy to study from. He's a very linear draftsman, somewhat sloppy, I would say. But his concepts of understanding the mechanisms of the body as a machine that artists need to understand from a, a, a common sense standpoint, there's no one better than probably Bridgman at talking about that. But you have to learn to interpret his drawings cleaner so that they can, you can take this information and make a beautiful drawing out of it. That's an art in and of itself and it's something we'll work with you on. In a, there's a couple anatomy classes. We have eight different anatomy classes. Um, the intuitive anatomy or one of the fundamental anatomy classes is actually going through the Bridgman book, learning to interpret his drawings, cleaning them up and learning how to apply them using other artists that are really good like Frazetta is like a clean version of Bridgman. Um, one of the, he, he st I believe he studied with him. That's what Fred said, even though he would claim that he didn't when he was alive, but he didn't claim, he cl you know, he always claimed this, I was a genius and he was, but that he just learned everything on it. You know, he just liked this kind of sensationalized how good he really was. And he was, um, Elliot Goldfinger, you're going to want to go to sleep, right? But a great resource to go to, to cross-reference Bridgman or other more chaotic draftsmen. This is going to be your clean source to go to. And that's a great book, and that, uh, this is my second or third copy. One of them is completely destroyed from use, uh, mostly in, in uh, sculpture classes. I used to take a lot of sculpture over the years. The Barg book, I'm not a huge site size guy, but, um, but you, it's hard to argue with some of the results these guys got with that system. And this, this was a very expensive book for a long time. It's now back in print. It was 1000 bucks. I don't know. It was hard to find. And it was out of print. It didn't look like it was ever going to be printed again. Now it's back in print. Um, it's a good book. Um, the only um, really simple, like, man, so simple, it's hard to draw that simple. I mean, he's not using the rhythm lines that we use. So he's not using the Riley abstractions. I navigate using comparative measurement. So I guess, and then I fix my guesses until it looks right. And so I make educated guesses based on bone protrusions, muscle rhythms, my understanding of anatomy. And so if I was drawing that, you would see me draw the rib cage. You'd see me draw from side to side. You'd see me draw transparent information that he's only drawing around more the outside form. I find it very difficult to get proportional figures by drawing around the contours of the outside of the drawing. Almost impossible. Uh, very difficult. And um, again, not having trained in sight size, but um, understanding a bit of it. And, and, and I think it's fantastic for the initial, maybe, beginning stages of training somebody when they're first developing their eye from a raw standpoint, where they really are having, because jumping into this school and having to guess, like right out of the chute, you're going to have to rely heavily on us, and that's why we're so hands-on. In sight size, you could be a little more hands-off because it's more controlled. It's a gridding system. You've got your cast. It's not moving. And you could come check up on the t uh, students every periodically every once in a while. In this technique, you've got to be on them all the time and be there, and it's a harder way to teach. But the sight size is a great method. You know a lot about it, so if anybody has questions, you could address it. Not with me. I don't know enough about it, but I would like to address more, uh, you know, have some conversations with you about it as well. Um, it's fascinating to me, but not having come from that, 
Um, and I, I, I was going into industries that were heavy invention industries, which again, are more tailor-made for comparative measurement. And that's things like visual development, concepting, storyboarding, movie work, where it's fast analyzation and quick out of your head with no reference, bad reference, or whatever, and still making it look good. And that means you have to commit everything to memory. So I think the window in comparative measurement at a true level is way longer than maybe site size for getting proficient because you have to memorize everything. And all you can remember is to draw it 10, 15, 20, 100 times. And a lot of people say, geez, that would just bore me to death to have to sit and draw that arm 10 times before. And a good way you can test yourself is draw a Bridgman, you know, very concentrating, looking at the reference, drawing it as nice as you can, cleaning it up, and do a whole you know, you know, montage of arms and stuff, and then take a break for 15, 20 minutes, come back, turn the page, and try to do it out of your head. Did anything stick? Because if not, you got better dexterity, but you're not, you don't have any information that you can really draw upon to manipulate a form to make it look better. Um, so ultimately, you will have to become more, a little more into memorization, but it's like a muscle. Uh, muscle memory visually will strengthen with use, and as you get, just like muscles when you're working out, and over time, you'll be able to remember things in a fraction of the time that it used to take you. Like now, I can remember a piece of visual information by drawing it two or three times. It used to take me 20 or 30 times. So now it's taking me a couple times before I can pretty much get it in there. Um, all Prima, Richard Schmid. If you don't know Schmid's work, he's still alive. Probably one of the, you know, he's a living master. I mean, he's awesome. He's good at still life. He's good at landscape. He's good at figure. He's good at narrative. He's good at everything. And he, um, he's an all-rounder. But he also very articulate. I don't know if he had a ghostwriter for this or if he wrote it himself. But whoever wrote it, I think it was him, very articulate. One of the best books on painting you could probably ever buy. And it's um, the most articulate books, the most insightful that I've had. Um, it's about 150 bucks hardcover and 45 softcover. It's worth hundreds of that, times that for me. Uh, great book. Um, I just add real quick too. Not, it's, it is a great book on painting, but it's even one of the better books on drawing. Yeah, it's just. Sure that half of the book is what it's really about, which is the fundamental drawing skill. So yeah, that you can't say enough about that book. I mean, that, that thing's insane. Um, I have so in my library, I have a. a a body of books that are primarily for studying uh, information that has to be memorized. And then I have a whole other section for inspiration that's people I would love to someday be considered in the same, uh, you know, same category as. The Sargents, the Soroyas, the Fetchens, the Repins, the Tromskoys, the, geez, you can just go down the list. Um, Susan Lyons, awesome, right? So you're going to have like just inspirational books. So she paints really, she's got, you know, just her and uh, Scott Burdick are married. Scott, they're both phenomenal draftsmen, phenomenal painters. Um, her drafting is really beautiful, gorgeous drawings, gorgeous color, good edge work, good design, good everything. She's just a good painter. Um, you know, their husband and wife, like Eric and Meadow, mar are married, and they met here. And Meadow, phenomenal painter. Eric, a phenomenal painter. Eric, illustration. Meadow, more fine art. I don't see any difference between the two. Fine illustration, fine art. No difference. Just... Eric's working for clients that are dictating what he's painting. Meadow's working for herself, dictating what she's going to paint. So that's your major difference between the two. But yeah, this is just awesome paintings. They're just really cool. So anyway, that's an inspirational book. I could learn, I could do some uh, studies from her, painting studies, and absorb her color feel. I could absorb her edge work. I could absorb any number of things just by copying her paintings and memorizing visually what she does, of taking what I like of that and injecting it into my work. Maybe I take 5%, maybe you take 10%, maybe someone else takes 45%. You, everyone's going to take different percentages of these influences. And ultimately, you're going to have your own opinion on top of that, and you're just going to be a hodgepodge of unbelievable skill that looks a lot like all the great people that you admire, at which time you're going to be associated and guilty by association with those same people. A lot of people say, oh, you paint very much like Fetchin. And I'm like, that's not an insult. That's one of the best painters that's probably ever lived, in my opinion. So when someone says, oh, your work's very reminiscent of that, that's not an insult at all. I mean, a lot of people, someone's always going to compare you to somebody, right? They're, they just are. It's, it's almost impossible to have them not do that. And there's been so many painters on the planet before you, it's almost impossible to lay down paint some way that hasn't been done already. I mean, it, there's only so many ways to put paint on a flat surface. And it's probably been done. Um, compositionally, color feel, um, those kind of subtle things that you're going to learn are what are going to be your fingerprint identity that's going to differentiate you. But you would want your drawing proficiency, painting proficiency, to be consistent with the great masters of the past. So everyone's saying, damn, he draws as good as Repin. You know, or he composes as good as Repin or me and Situ. Or you know, you look at someone like me and Situ, who's a contemporary Chinese painter, in the same elk is like someone like Ilya Repin, who was a great Russian painter that trained Fetchin and, and many others. Um, you would see uh, 
Mian, in, in Mian's work, I would see very similar qualities to Repin's staging. You know, um, his color feels different. His subject matter is different. But his staging ability, drawing ability, and his ability to manipulate form and to tell narratives is right up there. You know, um, but Repin, I, I, I was fortunate enough to withstand one of our teachers, uh, go to Russia with him a couple years ago and see uh, most of Repin's work is, is between two different museums there and the whole body of everything he did. And it'll just freaking floor you. The size of them, the complexity of them, the subtlety of the edge work, the color harmonies. I mean, just amazing. I mean, it's just breathtaking. It'll just take your breath away. Um, so it is fun to see those things. And don't let them intimidate you. Let them be a springboard from which you excite yourself. I mean, sometimes you will. I got the Soria show. And I, I, I was teaching in Spain a, a few years back, and I ran across that show, the retrospective show of, uh, of Soroya's in the Prado. And it was three stories of his work, and it was pretty much everything he had done between that and his house. And that was the best show I'd ever seen, better than the Sargent show, better than the Mooka show, probably the best show I've ever seen. And it was just the magnitude of the work, the consistency of the work, the strength of the work, the strength of the vision, unbelievable. It make you just, there was a guy even from this planet, you know, I mean, what, you just look at the, the, the across the board and just, uh, it was an amazing body of work. You just had to take your hat off and go, I don't know, I hope I got something like that in me a little bit, maybe. Uh, Gearhart's is really good, um, pretty good friends with him. Been t I've taken workshops with him in the past and gotten to know him over the years. Dan's a pretty young painter. I mean, he's probably five years older than me, maybe. Um, but he's been around for a long time painting. He studied um, Chicago Art Institute, um, also at the Palette and Chisel with uh, Schmid, along with Susan Lyon and Scott Burdick. These guys all used to hang out together. Uh, Rose Franson, who's phenomenal. Um, they were all friends in school and all came out of the similar, a similar background. So he's very strong, impressionistic painter. Very into painting what he sees, not what he knows. So he would, comp he would contradict most of what I just said. He would say, paint what you see, not what you think you see, not what you know. But there's always been battles between those two uh, throughout history. Um, one of the most noteworthy would be John Singer Sargent and Edwin Austin Abbey. Both ridiculously phenomenal artists. Edwin Austin Abbey comes from the standpoint, why would you want to paint what you see? It's so boring. Paint what you would like to see. Schmidt would see, I, I mean, um, Sargent would be, paint just what you see and don't mess around. How could you argue with either one of them? But they're both come from different mindsets, different. Um, there's a painting of a scarecrow, like a black mannequin out in the snow that Sargent did. And it's really an oddest painting when you look through his paintings and you just go, damn, that's just so weird. And I guess he was painting with Edwin Austin Abbey and he turned it into a minstrel dancing through the snow or something. And Sargent just painted what, exactly what it looked like. And it was just, you got, they just it was the, 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 the banter between the two was hilarious with, with what they both thought about the subject matter and how they interpreted it. So there's a lot of room for interpretation. You're going to find great painters on both sides. I don't think it's so much about picking a side as it is being accepting of the two different disciplines and saying that good art is good art across the board. Hard to argue with the Jerome, hard to argue with the Bouguereau, how phenomenal those efforts are. But... Um, on the flip side, hard to argue with Fetchin and, and the other impressionistic painters that are so phenomenal. So both of them, at some point in your career, you'll make a choice. And the choice will be hopefully an educated one based on your skill, not on what you're not able to do. So you paint loose because you're not able to handle your medium. A lot of people just get lazy and start slinging paint. And, uh, and at that point, you're kind of gave up. You know, it's like, well, that's not articulate loose painting. That's just venting, visual venting. Um, maybe healthy. I mean, it could be therapeutic. But at the end of the day, I mean, it's not going to be articulate enough to probably sell a product. And you're selling an idea or you're selling a product. In fine art, you're selling an idea. And in illustration, you're primarily selling a product. So um, that's one of the major differences. And so, you know, some of you will um, be technicians and would be best off working somewhere like DreamWorks or Disney or ILM or Lucas and make a good living and grind, it, grind out the vision of somebody else because your vision may not be there. Not everybody's a visionary, you know, and you just got to be able to accept that. Um, some people are visionaries, but I have met very few, you know, that you just go, whoa, you know, that person's working with a different, different faculties, right? Just different ability to perceive, deeper, you know, whatever. Um, so it's not all, you know, you could be like Gerhardt's. I don't see him as a visionary. I see him as a great technical painter that paints very romantic stuff, very sellable, very cool, but... I don't see it like changing the world or anything. I just think it's beautiful painting, which I think that, well, that would change the world in some, in some people's eyes. That's a nice little way to 
kind of slowly work, work at injecting beauty back into the world we live in. So anyway, uh, drawings, books, pencil sharpening.